Amen. Before we get into um, today's Bible lesson, there were some things that were stirring in my heart this morning that I want to um, look at first. If you'll go to Hebrews um, chapter 13, verse 8, we're going to look at four openings um, that are going to be considered um, part of our introduction, which we, we, you know we don't have time for. So be real, um, be real timely and even um, how you turn, how you take notes, because um, we want we want to make sure we we do what the Lord would direct us to do today. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8 it says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I want you to write this down because He is the same. His power and provision supersedes every season. Because he is the same, his power and provision supersedes every season. Because he is the same, his power and provision supersedes every season. Now that's an important thing, that we serve a God that does not change. So all that we see that he is, that he was, that he did, he continues to be that despite what we feel, despite what we see, despite what we experience. So this is important because he lives in us. In Psalms 115, verses 14 through 15, Psalms 115, 14 through 15, the Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. You are blessed of the Lord, which have made heaven and the earth. So just because he is the same doesn't mean we are to be the same. We're to increase. We are to increase. And this has nothing to do with what's going on around us. This has nothing to do with what the world says, what the world does. We are to increase. And so you can write it this way. The what remains, but we are to increase. Meaning what I'm called to do, what I've been asked to steward, that doesn't necessarily change. But I'm to increase in that thing. I'm to increase in that. Now, if we don't watch ourselves, we'll take our eyes off of the word and off of kingdom and put our eyes on what we see around us. And we, and and especially in a time like we're living in, um, where, where you can absolutely see fear, um, you know, and, 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 and the thing, and, and so we just know what the word of God says. And, and because you know him and you know the power of his resurrection, you can see things for what they are, not for what people tell you that they are. You know, you can see them for what they are. You know, I think about um, whenever football teams several years ago first decided that they were going to take a knee during the national anthem or the Pledge of Allegiance. I don't watch sports, but I know it was anti-patriotic. Um, and so the, the team that won that year was the Philadelphia Eagles, and they had determined as a team that none of them would take a knee. When you take the posture of defeat it does something to you psychologically. And so the same is true when people put on a mask, that that does something to you psychologically as it pertains to how you perceive yourself and how you perceive those things around you. And so regardless, um, you know, it's important for us as believers, you know what anybody else does. I I had an opportunity where where I thought as though I would be required to wear one um, in the last couple weeks. And so this is how I was gonna wear it. Do you guys have that picture back there? This is how I was gonna wear my mask. I really like this look. Cause it's like, if you're gonna do it, you might as well just go big. Do you know what I mean? I didn't have the full on wrapping. I'm gonna have to have somebody show me exactly how they do it. But because um, I just refused to, to, I didn't have to do it anyway. Um, so it wasn't even a deal, but you can just see these things. And, and again, you have to decide, I don't care if you wear a mask. I don't, you like, you, you got to figure that out between you and the father. I refuse to wear one for any reason. Um, but the thing about it is you have to know for you where your eye goes, your life goes. And so if you're going to get stirred up about these things that are going on around you, you're going to be spending precious energy that should be reserved 
for your kingdom responsibilities. And you only have so much energy. You only have so much time. You only have so much intellect. And I don't know about you, but I need all that I can get in order to accomplish what I'm called to accomplish. And so who we are, that remains, but we are to increase in that thing. In Genesis 1, 26 through 28, and God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness and let them have dominion. Write this down. Dominion must be exercised. Dominion must be exercised. I wrote it this way, and we're going to look at a passage in Numbers. Um, We're going to look at Numbers 32, verses 1 through 9. Your best days aren't behind you. Your best days aren't behind you. But dominion must be exercised. In Numbers 32, and we're going to look... At, uh, one through nine. Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of cattle. When they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, that behold, the place was a place for cattle. The children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spoke to Moses and to Eleazar the priest and unto the princes of the congregation saying, All of these names, verse 3, even the country which the Lord smote before the congregation of Israel is a land for cattle, and your servants have cattle. Wherefore said they, if we have found grace in your sight, let this land be given unto us as your servants for a possession, and don't make us go over to the Jordan. Moses said unto the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, okay, so basically you want your brothers to go to war while you sit here comfortably. And wherefore discourage ye the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord has given them. This is exactly what your fathers did when I sent them from Kadesh Barna to see the land. For when they went up unto the land, the valley of Eskel, and saw the land, they discouraged the heart of the children of Israel that they should not go into the land which the Lord God had given them. Write this down. Complacency is discouraging. It takes courage out of you. What do we see here? We see the 12 tribes of Israel moving in to possess the land, but a couple of them said, you know what? We don't want to go all the way in. We're totally good with this land right here. We don't want to have to cross over to the Jordan, right? We're good right here. This is an attitude that some people take. We are good. But do you know what Moses ended up having a conversation with? Listen, that's fine. If y'all want to stay out here, but y'all are going to fight with everybody else. If you don't want the, you're not going to sit out here and not put in any work. Complacency will bring discouragement. It takes courage out of you. I wrote it this way in my notes. Comfortable and complacent go together. Comfortable and complacent go together. It's this, 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 this war in our own lives between managing and stewarding. Managing and stewarding. Write it this way, manage is what you do with yesterday's victory. Manage is what you do with yesterday's victory. But stewardship is how you keep taking victories. Managing is what you do with yesterday's victories. But stewardship is how you keep taking victories. Most people just manage their lives. Do you know what it means to manage? It means to continue to get along, to carry on, to cope. <laughs> manage means to cope, to carry on, to get along, to uh, uh, this idea of holding on. Leaders have to do more than manage. Yeah. Yes, there are things to manage. Yeah. But, but ultimately, if as a church, if we don't keep exercising dominion, if we don't keep taking, a th- because see, the enemy has an agenda. He's been progressively endeavoring to gain ground yeah. since the beginning of time. Yeah. And if the church allows itself to be comfortable, then before you know it, we've lost ground. Right. You can't keep taking ground when you have the mentality of a manager. Okay, a a managing kind of mentality doesn't continue to grow relationships. Doesn't continue. And first of all, listen, growth starts with you. How can I be a person of growth? It's not just the accumulation of knowledge. It's the practice of that knowledge. 
and you never move past your last act of disobedience. So if you're justifying sin, you can't grow. No matter what else you try to do, if in and of yourself your heart condemns you, you'll have no confidence to keep on going, keep on keeping on, so to speak. And so leaders have to do more than manage. Uh, I wrote it this way in my notes. Managers is a, a managing perspective is a real me perspective. You know, for example, you're managing your household and for the most part, you don't really have a lot of accountability in that, right? No one walks around and talks about how much people, how much they're in debt, right. how much, uh, you know, how clean their, their closet is. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Like if, if your husband's good and if you're single, then you have zero accountability, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? Manage is about you. It's kind of like the, the parable of the talents, the guy who said, this is all I have and I'm gonna bury it because I'm afraid and everything's good and I still have it, I didn't lose it, right? Managing is this more inward focus of just like me, whereas stewardship is we. Yes. Yeah. Stewardship is we. Manage is me, right? It's the idea that like, could anybody come into your home at any given time? Or would you have that, if, if, if that's not the case, then you're a manager, right? You're not a steward. And listen, how you do you, just you, is gonna be how you do everything else because you're not gonna be a different person than you are. You understand what I'm saying? And so managers, it's this real me thing. Stewards is more we. Um, if you look at the definition of steward, although it's very similar to the definition of a manager, stewards, it, it goes a little bit broader in the definition because it brings out this idea of one who manages another's. In order to, to operate with a kingdom perspective, you have to realize that you are not your own. Your life is not your own. Yeah. Your talents are not your own. Your kids are not your kids. Yeah. They are not your kids. You were the vehicle that got them here, but they belong to God. Yeah. They aren't yours. And when you get to heaven, you don't all get to stand up there like the cutest Christmas card ever. Yeah. Like this big package deal. Yeah. They're on their own. Yeah. It's good. And you're on your own. Yeah. And so you don't get a free pass for what you were called to do by pulling out the mom card yeah. or pulling out the dad card. Right. That's a part of what you're called to do, but that's not eternal. Right. I had somebody to tell me years and years ago, um, you know, that Pastor Greg and I needed to get on with it. We needed to have kids because kids were the only thing that you take to heaven. And obviously this is an elder. And so I, it's not really the time to get into this theological you know, thing or, you know, you can't get into anything, you know, you just smile, you just smile. Um, and the thing about it is that's not the only thing that you take to heaven. Yeah, right. Now, hopefully you take them there. Hopefully they get there on account of your leadership, but ultimately should they choose not to, you know, that's not entirely on you. Right. Right. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's a lot more that you're going to take up there than just that. But all of that to say that, that as it pertains to stewardship uh, and, and, and operating with the kingdom mentality, it's recognizing that all that I have is not for me and it's not of me. Yeah. It's of him and it's for him and it's to be used in, our, in an interactive way with other people, which means if I don't do all I'm supposed to do, then that affects of the people that I'm connected with. And so it also gives the definition of one who manages a ship, oversees a ship. I started reading a book this week. I mean, it's written by a retired Navy captain. And um, so obviously a lot of the, the principles and the perspective is new to me. I've, I'm not, I've never been in the Navy. Um, I've never been a submarine captain or any of that. So all of that lingo is new to me, but, but ultimately having an inside look into this thing that I've never really exposed myself to before, I realized the, the massive weight of responsibility that is literally the way that the Navy works um, on this one individual. So, so everybody else kind of gets a list and they're told what to do. But the buck, as it pertains to this kind, uh, this branch of our military, the, the, the buck absolutely stops with the ship captain. No matter what goes wrong, it's on him no matter what. Like he is the ultimate 
in charge. And so when I saw that as it pertains to the definition of steward, I'm thinking about the massive weight and responsibility. Yes, there's different departments, there's different responsibilities, but they all will look at him and his commanding officers will look back at him and if someone else failed it still falls on him so so it's this idea stewardship is this idea of being ridiculously accountable ridiculous making myself see a manager it does it doesn't really make themselves accountable in the sense that like i said like if you're not doing what you know to do financially um you know even as it pertains to the tithe you know uh normally as executives you know uh when things start getting really really complicated with an individual or with the family we'll look at their giving records because nine times out of ten they're not Because it's just people who tithe, they have a certain understanding, their heart's right. And and so, but but for the most part, you could absolutely sit in church year after year after year, go on in a in a semi, you know, functioning relationship with your pastors and, and in your departments, and nobody really know that you're not doing all you should be doing as it pertains to your finances. Right? There's really no accountability for an individual who just endeavors to manage their life as opposed to stewarding their life. See, a steward realizes the responsibility to keep stretching, to keep moving, to keep making changes, to keep growing. And so as it pertains to our life, I just want to encourage you to really evaluate and the Holy Spirit will help you. And and we'll just touch a a couple of things today because we didn't really, um, we were super long on that introduction. Am I really managing or am I stewarding? as it pertains to anything that I've been given the opportunity to be a part of. Uh, Managing is, there, there, that's necessary, that's a part of it. You've got to do something with the spoils, so to speak, with yesterday's victories. But if that's all that you do, you're not preparing to continue to take ground and experience victory. And in many cases, what will happen is you'll begin to set defeat in motion. Last week, we started looking at what we're going to continue today a little bit, just for a few moments. It was called Moments, Mysteries, and Rhythm. Moments, Mysteries, and Rhythm. And we'll look at Psalms 90, 12, but while you're turning there, just to kind of set up a couple of things, I'm going to pull up another verse that just came up in my heart. And then we'll jump into a little bit. Um, Proverbs 27, 23. Just one last thought on managing for today. And we may unpack that some more moving forward. I just want it to be so profound in our thinking that what's going on around us, really at the end of the day, I'm not responsible for that, but I'm responsible for me. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, which means there is a provision for all that's going on. But if I'm going to overcome that, I can't just look at my life like I'm just going to manage what I've got going. I'm going to have to continue to exercise dominion and be be thinking that way. Um, Okay, what did I say? Proverbs 27, 23. Be diligent to know the state of your flocks and look well to thy herds for riches are not forever and does the crown endure to every generation and so there is a there is a a a, a path there is a place for management but this you can see moves into stewardship into verse 24 because what you have right now you're not always going to have yeah. And you're not creating, um, you know, just because your marriage was great the year after you got married doesn't mean it's great now if you're just doing what you always did and even maybe less, you understand? And so so um, really trying to change with the help of the Holy Spirit our perspective from one of a manager um, to a steward. In Psalms 90 verse 12, teach us to number our days and recognize how few they are. Help us spend them as we should. And so we talked a lot about the use of our moments and prayerfully we're making a way for us to live at a higher level of spirit-led life. Um, 
not so concerned with and entangled with this here and now. And so one of the things that we said last week, moving out of moments, you can't maintain the momentum of faith without the consecration of your moments. You can't maintain the momentum of faith without the consecration of your moments. And so Proverbs 15, 32 says, an undisciplined, self-willed life is puny, but an obedient, God-willed life is spacious. So an undisciplined, self-willed life is puny, but an obedient, God-willed life is spacious. So how do we obey God? First of all, we obey his word. And then second of all, we adhere to that still small voice. And so as it pertains to mysteries, I want you to write this statement down. Methods should be downloaded as mysteries. Otherwise, you're just doing your own thing. Methods should be downloaded as mysteries. Otherwise, you're just doing your own thing. Methods, how I go about what I'm going about. It should be downloaded from him, otherwise I'm just doing my own thing. Now, let's unpack this just a little bit. Proverbs 16.3 says, commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. Psalms 37, five, almost the same thing. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him and he will bring it to pass. And then in 1 Peter five, verse seven, cast all your care upon the Lord for he cares for you. So this word, this word cast and this word commit are used interchangeably. And in the Hebrew, they both indicate or give us a word picture of rolling away, rolling away. So as it pertains to our every single day, we have an opportunity to do our own thing or to do things his way. Okay, so, so when, it, when it pertains to this, this ball, let's let this ball represent, and, and I don't mean like, um, you know, methods must be downloaded first as mysteries. The things that you know how to do as it pertains to like showering and your clothes and your laundry, okay, those kinds of things. Although I do believe that the Holy Spirit is the best hacker as it pertains to helping you do all that you do more efficiently. So I think there's always a place for his involvement, but I'm talking about if you're moving from manager to steward and if you're really intentional with your life and on purpose, like, you have to really evaluate like, am I in a better place this year than I was last year? And not like, because I wanna give myself a good grade. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yes, I believe by faith. No, I'm not talking about by faith. Right. I'm talking about the reality is you are better. Yes. You have made progress. Is it trackable? Because if I'm on a trip and I'm on my way from here to Dallas and I've been on the road, then I should be able to track my progress. I should be able to say, I used to be in Seminole, but now I'm in La Mesa or whatever, okay? Um, and so, so but, but as it pertains to this, let's, let's say this ball represents my to-do list or the things that I've got to steward. I have an opportunity and really there's no way that I can be in front of you right now without this ball being in your view. Everywhere I go, this goes. Right, it's really hard for you, even if I like hold it behind my back, I mean, you can still see it, otherwise you're aware there's something behind your back, you know what I mean? And so really, this is you living your life your way, with your thoughts, with your needs, with what you have to do, but, but the reality is that if faith goes and sits on the edge of that step representing our Father, which represents this intentional place of prayer and consecration of my moments, I can't roll this over to her being Him, my Father, and still possess it at the same time. So it's either gonna be in one of two places. Like you're either consecrated or you're not. Yeah. There's no middle ground. Yeah. Either He has it all 
in the sense that I've turned over control to him or I still have it. And if I still have it, it's going to get in the way of everything else that I have to do. It's not only on my mind, but it's being everything I'm doing, everything I'm saying, every conversation with my husband, with my wife, with my kids, it's all filtered through this thing, whatever this is, right? Whatever's on my list. But if I roll it to him, obviously, like I already illustrated, thank you, you can hold on to it. I don't have it anymore. In John 16, 13 in the Amplified, it says, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, full and complete truth, he will not speak on his own initiative. He will speak whatever he hears from the Father, the message regarding the Son. He will disclose to you what is to come in the future. See, you can live your life with this idea of planning and preparing and handling and managing in and of yourself, or you can cooperate with him. So it's the idea of rolling and then hitting it with tongues. God, I'm giving you all of this, and then I'm gonna pray in the Holy Spirit. And you're going to give me one step at a time. You know, we have a big opportunity in our company. I'm going to roll the care of that over on you. And then you're going to lead me into the next step. Because ultimately, what should be on your list every single day? Faith and love. Yeah. As a believer, that's it. Yeah. And if that's not your priority, right? I know I'm passionate about lists. I have lists for my lists. Right, but you can't live like that if, if faith and love doesn't supersede whatever it is on that list. If it's not all filtered through a consecrated relationship with him. Because Hebrews 10, 38 says the just shall live by faith. And Mark 12, 30 says that we're to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So last night, Pastor Greg and I, we, we had an opportunity. We we're, you know, like uh, thinking about some stuff. And it was like, it, it was, I was carrying it. And I can't carry it. I can't carry it, definitely can't carry it. And so I was crunchy and I was like, oh, fear, immediately. Worry is fear, yeah. anxiety is fear. Yeah. And so I'm being like crunchy and you know, like that. And I said, no, enough is enough. I'm casting, I'm rolling this over on you. Lord, I can't do anything about this. Yeah. I can't do anything about this, not just because it's nighttime and it's late and everything's closed, but because in and of myself, this is beyond me. Yeah. So good. Yeah. This is beyond me. And so I'm going to roll the care of this over on you. I'm going to stay in faith yes. and I'm going to stay in love. Yes. Right? So, so methods, otherwise you grit it out yourself. And I've done that. I know what that looks like. And it produces such rotten, bitter fruit. Yeah. Just gritting it out and just like, I'm going to make it happen. Like that's not the way that we were called to live. So the best way to prepare for your future is not to plan, but to pray in the Holy Spirit. Yes. And all the things that are there that, that are questions, you know, well, what am I gonna do about this? What am I gonna do about this? I'm not gonna do anything about that. That's right. I'm gonna roll the care of all of that onto him. And I'm gonna, cause he's, he's the Prince of Peace. He can't lead me if I, like there has to be a compatibility factor. He's not gonna meet me at my stress. Do you understand that? Right. He's not going to meet me at my disobedience. Right. He's not. He's not going to meet me at my lazy. Right. He's not going to meet me at my disobedience. He's not going to meet me at my stress. I want to encourage you this. He's not going to meet me at my carnality. Yeah. That's good. That's good. If you talk about other people, that is carnal. You can't keep going forward in the plan of God. That just came up in my heart last night. And it was almost like I visualized there being a struggle with you and with even people in your family. Quit hanging out with them. Yes. If you're not able to put your foot down, do you understand what I'm saying? That is carnal. Right. God can't meet you at carnal. That's right. That's right. You spend all your time using your words, which are the precious thing that you have that no other entity ever created right. has. Yeah. So good. Yeah and you expect to be a mature believer, that is carnal. He will not meet you at your carnality. Right. You have got to meet him on his terms yeah. and then you will access his plan. So you rid yourself of carnality. You rid yourself of lazy. Good. Gossip is so carnal. Yes. It is so carnal yeah. and it's deadly. It's deadly yeah. to you. I don't care if you're talking about people that you know or people that you've never met. You cannot expect to be this powerful steward and carrier of your purpose and call 
and be popping off at the mouth so good, so good. with the boys or with the family, with your mom, whoever. Right. No, you're going to stay in the same place. You'll be walking like the people who are around the same mountain. God's not, you got a little amen here, little you did that because he doesn't work that way. Right. He can't, he cannot work that way. It defies his character. It will repel itself. Yeah. You'll have a form of godliness, but there won't be any flow. There won't be any real rhythm. So the best way to prepare you for your future is not to plan, but to pray in the spirit. So we'll unpack that.